Welcome to Nobel Prize Conversations. We've gone back to the archives for this episode. I'm Claire Brilliant. I'm here with our host, Adam Smith. Who are we going to hear from today, Adam? Well, Claire, today it's 2013 Laureate in Economic Sciences, Robert Schiller. And how long ago was this conversation with Robert recorded? I spoke to him in 2014, just the year after he'd been awarded the prize. Why have we picked this episode to come back to you now? It's particularly interesting to hear how he speaks about technology. He's really worried by it and also excited by it. And he keeps referring to it throughout the episode. And it's just fascinating to hear him speak about it, me ask about it, and to realise just how fast things have moved. I completely agree. He mentioned so many different things, Google Glass being one of them, which... uh... (laughs) Nobody will have heard of that anymore, yes. (laughs) Uh, and also, I mean, yes, you know, he speaks about not having to be in the same place. You know, teaching groups of students online, it all, all seems quite new the way it was talked about 10 years ago. Yeah, well, you know, we've, we've all have sadly got rather used to that, but it, it was all new then. A lot's changed in that time. Well, yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> the episode starts with him just returned from Davos, where technology was very much on his mind. So let's drop in there. You are just back from Davos, is that right? Yes, it was a great, another, it's my 12th, I've always enjoyed them. <laughs> so uh, does it change it, attending as a, a, a new laureate in the economic sciences? Well, a lot of things have changed. I, I'm, what really amazes me is people wanting to take their, pic, <laughs> their picture with me. Uh, I never had that before. <laughs> And at Davos, I had people standing in line to do that. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> what is it that you like so much about Davos if you've been 12 in a row? Well, it seems to me that uh, I know Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum, is controversial. But it seems that Klaus Schwab, who is the uh, genius behind this annual conference, brings together people in business and government and some academics who are uh, socially involved, care about people. Uh, Believe it or not, there are even billionaires who care about people. (laughs) He invites them. But he doesn't particularly, or he or his organization doesn't particularly emphasize them. But uh, people with, uh, often with power, or people who've published ideas and, uh, or introduced legislation, uh, So I just like to, and they seem to be from so many different walks of life, that I like to uh, interact with them. I learn from them. Mm. What do you think the secret of its success has been? Because it's become a very influential meeting. Well, I think it's run well. I think uh, it's been going for many years, and uh, influence rises if you consistently fulfill some objective. Uh, mm. And yeah, I don't fully understand why things are, why certain institutions have the prestige they do, but uh, it seems to be not unwarranted. <laughs> I suppose yes. I suppose one could ask the same questions of the of the Nobel Foundation and its prizes. So uh, there must be a temptation at Davos to speak about so many things. There's so much going on, and you're probably being ask right, left, and center for comment on things. How do you resist the temptation to comment uh, on things that are, so to speak, beyond one's sphere of competence? This is a uh, tension in modern society. We admire people who have expertise and know what they're talking about. Unfortunately, pursuing of of expertise doggedly can't be the goal for everyone, because being specialized means losing some breadth of understanding. So we need both kinds of people. And uh, I, yeah, so Davos is for broad thinking. We need the researchers who will focus in. Uh, it's just, uh, there's a problem that uh, we can't uh, the human minds at this stage in history are still separate and they still can't pool all of their knowledge 
effectively, and we have to work around that as best we can. <laughs> I like the idea of, at this stage in history, a, a separate. Do you foresee a time when that Im situation improves? Well, one thing that struck me about Davos is that I thought there was greater urgency. Now, maybe this is just where I went and who I heard, but there's greater urgency about the potential problems for our society and our economy of artificial intelligence, broadly construed. I, I tried on Google Glass for the first time. <laughs> That's, someone had up there and said, look, try them on. <laughs> and you know what made me think, wow, you know, I think we'll be wearing these. And uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I can see that they would be addictive. Yep. And so your mind is... Your everyday activities are going to be affected by new technology in, in the most transforming way. And it is frightening. And, and it was that sense of fear that I thought I detected at the latest Davos. And I detected all over the place, not just at Davos. Everyone's worried. Just in the last few years, we have phones that, uh, like Siri on iPhone uh, or, uh, or others. You can talk to your phone. There's <laughs> nobody there, and it answers you. <laughs> Something is changing that is profound and I think has profound implications for our society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just getting back to that theme of specialization versus breadth, um, I mean, how do you individually cope with that? Because um, I suppose conferring the Nobel status on you adds to people's desire to hear you comment on things on all nature of things. Um, how do you deal with it? Well, I, I think to some extent it's a life cycle thing. Younger people uh, specialize, and then as they get older, they get broader, and uh, uh, it's natural. Uh, I, some highly specialized research that might have uh, attracted me when I was in my 20s I don't think realistically I'm going to do them now. Hmm. But I think maybe my, uh, you know, I'm trying to be part of a society that, uh, and trying to contribute what I can. And maybe it is true. With, you know, with age comes wisdom, at least we want to hope so. And uh, I, I should perhaps be more broad. But on the other hand, you are right that there comes a risk that you end up talking fluff, things that everybody already knows. And that's the criticism that some people make of Davos, by the way. Hmm. So I, I, I have to, everyone has to deal with these issues. They're, they're, they're fundamental issues in our society. As you say, it's a, I mean, it's a tension. One wants to get engaged in things. How far can you go? But I, I see that in my students. I, I think I, when I teach a class... If I get too technical and narrow, I'll lose some students and they'll not care anymore. But if I go the other way and I become too generalized, they'll think, oh, I already know this. You know, this is too broad. And have you found yourself increasingly wanting to get engaged with bigger and bigger audiences as you go through your career? Well, it's happened. Uh, I think I've overcome stage fright substantially. <laughs> Did you ever suffer from stage fright? Well, I remember in high school, I had, I had something memorized, and I got up in front of the whole class to recite it, and I just couldn't remember it. It was a panicky feeling. It was just my class, <laughs> and I'm beyond that now. When I was a child, my mother <laughs> told me not to value celebrities, that uh, they're mostly fake, and they have publicity uh, managers, and I, I've had a certain contempt ever since for celebrity status. Uh, well, I'd not, but that means I don't exactly value large audiences, or at least I have mixed feelings about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, understood, but at the same time, 
you'd like to be speaking to a bigger audience. You, I mean, you have you, for instance, you have a column. You have a regular column. Yeah, I have two of them. Yeah. Two, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so, that, I mean, that indicates that you want to say something to an audience who are very much outside the academic sphere. Well, uh, <clears throat> why do I do these things? <laughs> I don't know exactly. <laughs> Uh, I, I was on the student newspaper in my college, so I have a journalistic side. Uh, yeah, so I could go either way. You, you know, I think the directions you take in life are some somewhat random. I was invited to give these newspaper columns. Uh, I didn't approach them with the idea. Hmm. And... Uh, so, so then, it may have reflected my mood at the time uh, that uh, that or, or a frustration with the progress of macroeconomics, which I was teaching, and a sense that maybe I could be more productive with a broad picture than uh, doing a. Uh, but I don't know. I never really went one way or the other. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, <laughs> no. I do both of these things. So <laughs> that's uh, Maybe it's a joint product. You know, that's a term economists use. Uh, certain kinds of productive activities benefit by being done together. Like the family farm, you, you have chickens, <laughs> and you have cows, and you also have wheat growing in the fields. And the theory was that those activities work well together because they fill up different available time slots for your work. Hmm. And similarly, uh, there's the idea of the modern university that, com- that uh, combines teaching uh, and research uh, based on a theory of education that Humboldt gave, uh, Bildung durch Forschung, I think, in German, <laughs> <laughs> education through research, uh, and uh, that uh, works. That I think for a research scientist, it's actually productive not to just stay in the lab all the time, but to take some time out and talk with young people about what you do and talk in much more general terms than your current lab experience. Now, I guess I thought writing a newspaper column is like that. It's... It's teaching, it's another kind of teaching, I suppose, mm. but it just makes me think more broadly. And I thought I would be more productive doing that. So I also do public speaking to different kinds of audiences. And every time I speak to a different kind of audience, I reassess things from their point of view as part of my preparation. And I imagine, what are they going to think of this topic? And then I actually hear from them. Uh, and. It seems to me to be productive. You, you can you can narrowly focus and you can close yourself into a room and just think, and you'll come up with something that may be very intricate. But the question is, will it be right? Another sort of outreach you do is you're involved in in new models of education. You're teaching these online courses through this through Coursera to vast numbers of students who are not enrolled in the university but are. Uh, 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 following the courses online. Tell me a bit about that. Well, I've actually done this several times, not through Coursera, uh, through Yale. Mm. And I'm now starting with Coursera. Uh, and why do I do this? Again, I was invited. <laughs> uh, I, w- one thing about creativity, I've learned over the years, when someone thinks that you'd be the perfect person for some task, Take it seriously, <laughs> because uh, they, they often they know something. And also when they want to pair you up with someone else, matchmakers, I think that also matters. Uh, and I think that often you end up paired with someone very good. And it, good in the sense that you mesh well. Uh, so I, I guess, now the other thing about it, to me it was kind of an experiment, because I think It's like a step into the future through the online learning. I'm just wondering where this is going. And like everyone else, I have worries about it. Is it replacing people? I think that, well, my Coursera course currently has 101,000 students signed up. And I'm thinking 
that, that's a lot of classes. Um, <laughs> yes. And am I contributing to the unemployment of other teachers? Well, where are these people coming from? Where are these 101,000 students coming from? Are they in- it seems to be all over the world, judging from emails I get. Now, I, I've read studies that, unfortunately, it's not as uh, tilted as you might think toward poor, underdeveloped countries. It tends to be the developed countries, and it tends often to be older people who already have college degrees. Uh, so I'm thinking that perhaps I should try to reach out a little bit more toward the developing world. I don't know if I can get these people. Those are the people who need it the most. <clears throat> and, but I suppose, uh, it, I suppose it starts somewhere. I suppose you're using the Internet to make teaching available, and it, it, this will grow. This, is this the future of education? I mean, does it, does it in some ways, talking of, talk of redundancy of teachers, I mean, does it make, in any way, do you think university is redundant in the future? Can it all be done online? How do you, how do you see it evolving? I wish we had answers to these things. I don't know, and I don't see how anyone can know. I think that the artificial intelligence, and I'm, I'm using the grand term for it, grandiose term for it, <laughs> but generally computers are going to change our society in, in the coming centuries just profoundly. And it's going to matter. It's going to be life or death. Uh, I hope that we have a community spirit so that people who are uh, left behind in this uh, rush to modernity won't be, won't be hurt too much. But I, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid for the future. Mm. And it's, but now it's not obvious what online learning is going to do because we don't even know what the the future computer configurations will be. I'm kind of thinking that one likely outcome is that it won't be MOOCs, massive open online courses. That's what I'm doing with so many students. I'm thinking, and I don't know this, but that people will still want to have a personal relation with a real human being, and that therefore the form will be different. It won't be massive. It will be it just like uh, having a class by Skype or some kind of uh, communications device, but you still have a small class. It's still a teacher in a class. We don't have to be in the same room anymore. I don't know if you call that online, but maybe that's where it will go. And I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical that uh, MOOCs will really take over because it lacks the human interaction. It's too one-sided. Mm. Well, absolutely. I mean, if, if, if one thinks to, uh, back to all the conversations um, I've had, for instance, with um, Nobel laureates, most of them will talk um, animatedly about individual interactions they've had with mentors and colleagues in the past that have meant a very great deal to the way they've developed as thinkers. And that individual interaction with people who can guide one and lead one along the right path, stimulate one, seems to be absolutely key. And this sort of learning, where it's, it's, it's mass distribution of information to people without the personal contact, completely avoids that sort of, that, that chance right. interaction. Yeah, I'm thinking that that's probably valid for, uh, I'm guessing, <laughs> for our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our children. But eventually, who knows? You know this book by Ray Kurzweil called The Age of Spiritual Machines. When I first saw that book, I thought it was a little bit far out. But now I start to worry that he might be right. He's, he's claiming that our computers will get so good at talking to us that we'll start to think that they have a soul. <laughs> we'll start to think that they're our best friends and we don't need people anymore. <laughs> I, wor- I worry about that. I don't think so. I'm, I'm guessing it's not in our lifetimes. Mm. But what a thought, yes. Asking somebody, who <laughs> was, who was I, the mentor in your past? And they'll say, well, it was this computer I was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but just one more question about the, this teaching. I mean, how do you teach 101,000 students? I mean, h- how do you prepare your material for such a diverse group that you know so little about? Well, I prepare it as if they were my own students. Uh, I'm thinking that... Uh, 
my students come from all over the world. They tend to come from privileged families, but uh, I think I try to uh, avoid U.S.-centric talking. Uh, it's something that has bothered, always bothered me that Americans think that we're the only country that matters. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, I still fall into that trap somewhat, though. It's hard not to because I live here. But I, I try to not to. Um, I, I don't know what else I, I can do. I, I, I don't see the 101,000 students. I see my students in my class, and I know how they react. Switching gear a bit, I wanted to ask about, within economics, what is the appeal of the, of the study of the financial markets? I've always been fascinated by financial markets, going back to my graduate school days. Why is that? Because I think they're kind of a infrastructure of some complexity that guides our economic decisions. Uh, I, I, and, and, and it affects our society, our civilization, in ways that are not always good, but on balance are probably good. And people... Uh, around the world are embracing financial capitalism, more so over the last 30 years, and rejecting collectivist or uh, extreme socialist solutions. And so, there's, why is that? Well, I think because uh, finan uh, modern financial capitalism, while it can be cruel and uh, hurtful at times, seems to bring prosperity and great diversity of outcomes. So what I say finance is about, uh, uh, just changing the wording a little bit, finance is about financing activities. And what does it mean to finance an activity? Well, most things that people want to do require groups of people working together as part of organizations. And the organizations have to have resources uh, that, that they need. Mm. And people have to be incentivized to pursue the goals of the organization beyond their personal goals. And it has to be something that lasts for a long time to work effectively. We just mentioned the Nobel Foundation, <laughs> which is a nonprofit uh, financial entity. And we mentioned the World Economic Forum, another nonprofit financial entity. These are not, so finance is not really about making money, it's about achieving activities. And uh, so they have to be financed. That's what Alfred Nobel did. Mm. He just financed it. That's a very positive view of finance. It's not perhaps the view that a large section of the world's population hold of, of the financial institutions. Um, how do you go about, if you like, painting the financial institutions in a different light? Well, I'm not saying that Alfred Nobel is typical of founders of financial institutions. He is a bright light in the uh, in the field, but uh, it's it's not perfect. But I view our financial institutions as dealing with the imperfections of people. You know, we we're not all saints, uh, and uh, I, I like to point out that. 3% of the population in the world are psychopaths. <laughs> and so uh, we have people of all sorts. We have a system that allows a place for competition, allows people to <clears throat> express themselves without hurting anybody, hopefully, and as constructively as possible. <clears throat> so we'd rather not put the psychopaths in the mental institution We'd like to have something that channels their activities in a productive way. And uh, that's what we have. <clears throat> so, you know, people who are in charge of financial institutions are not always nice guys. Uh, but they're there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They're doing better than they, much better than they might have in a different system. Mm. So, so basically working to improve financial institutions is... A task that um, is 
not not just you know desirable but a- absolutely necessary in your view and a sort of a, 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 for you a sust- what sustains you in your work would you say well it seems to me that when economists are most productive it's usually when they uh, suggest improvements to our institutions <clears throat> unfortunately it's a frustrating task because there's a lot of inertia in our institutions and uh, we have vested interests for the present institutions who don't want them changed. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. One thing that the mention of financial institutions um, often conjures up for people is, is income inequality. And I know that's something you think strongly about. Yeah. Well, people have a very basic sense of justice and fairness. And uh, my, my recent book was called Finance and the Good Society. What is the good society? Uh, well, I think that's a term that has been used to define, to describe a society of people who are basically caring. They maybe they're mostly out for themselves, but they 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 have you know they'll they'll pick up a sharp object on the street before it hurts somebody. Uh, and it, it, so we take it almost for granted that that's there's a basic human. Uh, feeling that yes, uh, we're part of society that cares about other people, but the, the problem is that finance does seem selfish, especially when you have people trading against each other. So we have a game that uh, looks very unfriendly, but it still goes by certain rules. And a- after the game, as like in any game, the players can all get together and uh, be friends again. That's the vision, uh, but it doesn't always look nice. And it, and remember, there are some people who are not uh, motivated in a human way as we'd like. Mm. But as we currently have it, we have um, increasing income inequality in m- many places, and it's presumably in some ways the financial market's job to try and help alleviate that. Well, now that's one point that, yeah, I've been trying to stress, that finance is substantially about risk management. And if risk management is pursued correctly, it reduces inequality. So we have institutions of insurance, for example. What they do is prevent inequality from occurring because of any of the insured events. This is a powerful force removing inequality. And as time goes on, insurance can become more and more comprehensive in dealing with risk that that people face. And I think that it does help reduce inequality. Uh, It focuses on risks that people are concerned about and care about. It produces a plan to to deal with those risks as as they happen. And that's part of finance. And then portfolio management is another example that variations in portfolios, that people's investments, create inequality. And so as we improve our ability to manage those, we lower inequality. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not the whole story, but I've been arguing that these uh, financial techniques could be applied much more broadly and help reduce inequality even more. But I don't think we can get rid of it completely because some level of inequality is necessary to provide incentive. There still have to be penalties for failure or for lack of enterprise, lack of work, mm. but the, so that there will be some inequality at all times. Some, but the magnitude we have is extreme. And do you think there's enough attention paid to that? My the feeling is that there should be attention, especially for the future, that inequality has been getting worse. And if you extrapolate those trends, the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, as our children grow up, it's going to get maybe awful. And I think that we can at least have a plan. There is no plan. 
uh, to deal with this. Uh, I, I'm, I've been advocating that countries should legislate automatic changes in the tax structure in the future that, that will kick in automatically if inequality gets much worse. Uh, and uh, that's an idea. That's one idea. But uh, it would reframe the discussion uh, if if they could possibly do that. Mm, mm, mm. Because presumably one can't really be satisfied with <laughs> with a world where there, there are s such disparities between rich and poor. I think even the rich don't want it. <laughs> it it's... Uh, would you like to be a multi-billionaire amongst starving people? <laughs> I don't think that would be... I wouldn't be happy. See, the, the funny thing about inequality is that some people are thinking that most people, nice people, don't even try to get rich. Most people don't try. They, they take some job, like, you know, something that they, helps people. Uh, and in, in extreme cases, it would be idealistic jobs like teaching or uh, school teachers or nurses. Uh, and they do this because they naturally like people. And uh, it, so they feel a little bit annoyed when some people who don't seem to share their social feeling uh, use some very aggressive things to get rich. And uh, I can see that uh, that we don't want a society that rewards that kind of behavior too heavily. We can allow some of that, but mm. uh, you know, I think it's okay to have billionaires, <laughs> but let's not make it too extreme. I was looking at a list of countries by their Gini coefficients, which is a measure of inequality, and was struck that Sweden, on the list that I looked at, was the most equal country in the world. Uh, and I thought, that's where I just was with the Nobel thing. But it, it didn't seem so equal because I had dinner with a king <laughs> and his family. <laughs> I'd never experienced that anywhere else in the world. Uh, but I thought, well, in a sense, what the Swedes are doing, I, I, I can't speak for them, but my guess is that th their king and queen are hardworking people who are providing a certain kind of entertainment and meaning uh, and it's not it's not inequality but it's fun to look at rich people within <laughs> limits you know or kings and queens I had a great time <laughs> the dinner was very memorable so a society that was too equal would just get boring yes and although although you were taught by your parents not to think too much of celebrities yes everybody enjoys watching celebrities sometimes <laughs> <laughs> that's right Now, you've spoken about the need to take a behavioural view of finance. Um, this, of course, was at the root of, your, um, of a much publicised um, disagreement, if you like, between you and um, Eugene Fama about the interpretation of some of the data surrounding financial markets, uh, the rational versus the irrational um, analysis of what's happening in the markets. Do you, do you think it's important that people have focused so heavily on that discussion between you and Fama? Well, I, th I think it's, there's a subtle... Uh, the, the truth has some subtle dimensions which elude many people. There's, that you have to recognize that Fama has a real point. The real point is Markets are substantially efficient in some sense, in the sense that it's not easy to make money quickly <laughs> and that uh, opportunities to make money that work fast and effectively will quickly be discovered and overexploited and then they'll disappear. That's a basic truth. But I think there's another problem, though. Once you recognize this truth, you can easily bis be misled into assuming that the markets are perfect as they are when in fact they're not and that the efficient markets lesson is is uh, can lead you into wrong conclusions mm. uh, 
And it can lead you into conclusions, for example, that we don't need to regulate markets at all, uh, or very little. And that conclusion, or that we don't need government invention, intervention at all. And that conclusion can have real costs. Mm. But the focus of the attention has been on rational versus irrational. Is that what people should be thinking about? Or is that debate really not the main point? The term irrational suggests things that might be... We're, the problem is we have problems with our words. <laughs> what does irrational mean? Mm. Well, I guess in English that you think of a hysterical person <laughs> screaming and shouting or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Act, and you would say, come on, you're acting irrational. <laughs> But uh, I think the kind of not-so-rational behavior that underlies uh, bubbles in the stock market is not quite so extreme. It, it is more like uh, when you're crossing the street and there's a crowd of people crossing, you don't look both ways because you, <laughs> you just fall in step with the other people. And you don't realize that maybe nobody is looking, and you're all going to get run down <laughs> if you don't. Get out of the way. That's a different kind of irrationality. It's not suggested by the word irrational. The other thing is the word bubble. And I, I got into conflicts with Gene Fama about this during Nobel Week. And I, I, as the week progressed, I, I got the idea that he had a different concept about what I mean by bubble. And he thought that I mean that a bubble is the time when people are, A, acting very crazy <laughs> and sane, uh, and, uh, and it should be obvious to any rational person. And secondly, that it's all going to collapse suddenly and finally, like a bubble bursts, and then it's going to be all over. You know, when you mm. blow, blow a soap bubble and it collapses, it, it's catastrophic. Uh, so it sounds to him like one of the, one of those religious people who say the judgment day is at hand. <laughs> That's not what I mean by bubble. <laughs> yes, the semantics are important, but I mean they're important in a wider sense too, because the words that economists use when talking to each other, I suppose, strike the rest of us as being part of the language that we always use on a day-to-day -day basis. So it gives the idea that we should understand what economists are talking about, and therefore there's a, there's a sort of direct translation to the, to the world at large. Whereas, actually, there's a subtlety to the way you use words that most of us wouldn't be able to pick up on, I assume. Well, we have different cultures. We have an academic culture, and we have a news media culture, and we have a business culture. And yes, we use similar words, but uh, uh, they have somewhat different meanings. Also, we use words differently because there's different incentives. I think one problem with the word bubble is that news media people love that word <laughs> because it suggests impending catastrophe. Like, this thing is going to blow <laughs> any day now. You better take action or you're going to regret it. Uh, that attracts a lot of the reader's interest, and so... The term is overused by news media. It must be hard for you, because having predicted, been credited with predicting two bubbles, people must be, A, constantly wanting you to predict more, and B, expecting you to predict them if they do happen. Yeah, that is a problem, and I don't really know how to predict these markets generally. Uh, yeah, it, it's... Uh, the, what, one problem with economics is that everything... History doesn't repeat itself exactly. It's constantly transforming into different kinds. You see parallels between events, but they're not the same. Uh, and so how do you get scientific? How can you make a scientific forecast? I think weather forecasting is so much easier, although we still have problems that things are changing, like global warming that throws them. But ideally, weather is weather, and it repeats itself. Uh, and so we have uh, a difference that, uh, that our economic institutions are constantly changing. 
when in the United States they created the Federal Reserve in 1913, they thought that would be the end of uh, of banking panics and re- recessions. It turned out to be wrong uh, in 1929. But then we came up with new things like Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that was supposed to prevent financial crises. And it worked for a long time. And eventually everything, there's always adjustments and changes in the system that makes our previous solutions irrelevant, or at least only partly relevant. Mm-hmm. And, but it make, and it makes it very hard for somebody who, who gets set up a little bit like a Delphic Oracle by the press who say, right, when's the next one going to be then? I mean, how, right. yeah. how, how much do you worry about that, that pressure? Yeah, I'm trying not to make forecasts. To, I get quoted by the news media. They ask me on, on TV, do you think the home price uh, increases that we're seeing is another bubble? And so I try to say something sufficiently cautious. But there's a headline writer who <laughs> writes a headline that says, Schiller says we're in another bubble. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And then I suppose it could become a f- self-fulfilling prophecy because I suppose if people are listening to you too closely, <laughs> yeah, that's what uh, that, that's what one worry. Well, unfortunately, I'm not Fed chairman or a central bank head, so what I say isn't taken that seriously. Mm. <laughs> Which opens another topic for discussion. Do you ever entertain ideas of taking on that sort of role of moving into that sort of political arena? Well, I don't think I'd be a good politician. Um, my wife tells me that. <laughs> too. I, I, I have too much an impulse to speak the truth. <laughs> and the problem with politics is, uh, you know, I, I sympathize with these people. You can't just speak your mind as a politician, right? Everything has to be calculated. Uh, and I kind of like being just an outsider who says things that are sometimes a little sound a little strange. <laughs> they wouldn't get me elected. <laughs> what would you like people to say about you when your career is um, sort of coming to a close? Because at the moment, people tend to say, he's the guy who predicted the two bubbles. Oh, I, yeah, I think these two bubbles will be forgotten. They're already fading. People don't even remember the 2000 bubble. That, that's 14 years ago. The, the peak in the stock markets of the world that occurred in 2000. Uh, and uh, yeah, I find my students don't even know about 1929, some of them, <laughs> what happened in 1929. These things only persist if storytellers want to keep it going. So the 1929 stock market crash has been retold so many times, and it's kind of a legend, you know, like Mickey Mouse... <laughs> Or Sleeping Beauty, or something like that. Uh, everything else gets completely forgotten. Uh, of course, everyone is forgotten eventually. But I, I guess I'd like my legacy to be some improvement in our economic system. And uh, uh, I've been trying to focus on that. Now, unfortunately, academia doesn't seem to want to reward people who think about how we could change our economic institutions. Uh, Very, very rarely does an economics professor ever write draft legislation and send it to a politician (laughs) asking them to introduce this as a bill. We just don't seem to be on that wavelength very much. Why not? Because, I mean, obviously you can. uh, Law school professors may tend to do that more. Uh, it's a division of labor, and uh, economists are kind of abstract, and they see their role as as uh, explaining things the way they are. And then it's and they for, take yeah. And it's for other it's for others to pick that up, pick up that ball, and use the knowledge. Yeah. So uh, at Yale University, in the until I think in the sometime in the 1930s, they had a department of economics, sociology, and government. <laughs> so uh, it was all in one department, because all those problems are interrelated. Uh, but now, they, as in other universities, they've split them up into separate departments, and there's a political science department and a law school, and they're all going their separate ways. 
if we, if somehow we could integrate our thinking better, I think we'd be more effective. Mm. Um, last thing I wanted to ask you about was influences. You had Franco Medigliani as your PhD supervisor, um, who also received the prize in economic sciences. Um, who who influenced you as as a thinker? Would you say? Well, I'm actually struck in terms of economics. The first thing that comes to my mind. My brother, who was four years older than me, went off to college and took economics, and he had Samuelson's textbook, Paul Samuelson. He's another Nobel Prize winner, by the way. And uh, he brought, uh, over Christmas vacation, he brought his book home and left it out. So I read it. <laughs> That's the way I was. Anything that was left out, I would read. And I was so impressed with Samuelson. So here I was, like 14 years old, and I got off onto economics from him. Later, I had the privilege of uh, studying with him at MIT, uh, and I, I, I was uh, impressed by the uh, application of careful analysis to some of our society's deep issues of resource allocation, of, uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, the uh, support of organizations and institutions that... Uh, achieve goals that people really want. So maybe Samuelson is my most uh, important mentor. Again, despite your, uh, the, the um, advice of your parents to avoid celebrities, do you have uh, sort of heroes that you look to? Well, uh, uh, I, I suppose, I mean, I, I don't know where to start. One of them is John Maynard Keynes, the economist. What I particularly like about him is his first book in 1919 called Economic Consequences of the Peace. Uh, he uh, criticized the Versailles Treaty, which would have imposed heavy reparations on Germany, and practically predicted World War II in 1919 hmm. from the kind of rancor and anger that the reparations that were imposed by the Versailles Treaty would have caused. Uh, and uh, then he wrote another book in 1936 uh, about uh, stimulus policy for depressions. And uh, I, 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 I never met this person, <laughs> but I thought, I thought that uh, he had an uh, independence of thought and a sense of importance that I found uh, inspiring. Gosh, yes, the ability to see through the kind of haze, apply one's intelligence and focus correctly. Um, amazing attributes. But I have many heroes. <laughs> they're never movie stars. <laughs> and they're never singers. <laughs> great. OK, well, that's, that's been absolutely wonderful. All right, great. Thanks very much for speaking to me. Bye. This podcast was presented by Nobel Prize Conversations. If you'd like to learn more about Robert Schiller, you can go to nobelprize.org, where you'll find a wealth of information about the prizes and the people behind the discoveries. Nobel Prize Conversations is a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of FILT and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer for Nobel Prize Talks was Magnus Ullier. The editorial team for this Encore production includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lundquist, and me, Claire Brilliant. Music by Epidemic Sound. You can find previous seasons and conversations on Acast or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.